CBS 8's Jenny Day. Welcome to Around San Diego. I'll get you caught up on a week's worth of news and look ahead in just 30 minutes. First of all, though, go Aztecs. Now, secondly, another strong storm system did hit San Diego this week. It flooded roadways and downed trees all across the county. Flooded waters near the Tijuana River Valley prompted closures after inches of rain caused the river to flow at really high rates of speed. Ranchers are also affected by the flooding and some have really no way to get around it. It's extremely deep. It's hard to get around on trail and even some of the streets are getting quite wa washed out and like the actual asphalt gets washed away by the flooding and the rainwater. Yeah, rising waters are not the only problem. The damaged sewage pipeline south of Tijuana continues to contaminate the nearby coast with raw sewage. And because the rain has not really let up, meaning we have not yet had a chance to dry out, experts say this has left the ground saturated, which is one of the reasons for these new sinkholes, potholes, and mudslides that keep popping up. A San Diego State Geology professor tells us the more rain we get, the longer it will take for the sun to pull that water out of the ground and evaporate it. Another saturating rain, another opportunity to pump more water, to pull more water underground and uh, make hillsides more prone to failure than they have been. Yeah, Dr. Abbott says it's likely we could see more sinkholes and hillsides start to shift. Speaking of westbound lanes of State Route 78 between College Boulevard to El Camino Real remain closed. The lanes have been shut down since last week where crews are working to repair a sinkhole. The closure has been causing major traffic in that area for commuters and nearby businesses. A nearby chiropractor has been dealing with dozens of patient cancellations. My coworkers and a lot of the patients that we get here at Concentra have been affected by the commute. Um, a lot of them have been coming in later, just not able to make it at all. Yes, yeah, so no specific date has been announced for when those lanes on the westbound side will reopen. But once they are complete, they will have to close the eastbound side. Well, the condition of Lake Hodges Dam has been downgraded from poor to unsatisfactory. That's the lowest rating there is, and that means the dam needs immediate or emergency action. It comes after crews making recent repairs found severely deteriorated concrete. The public works director says that they are keeping the water at 280 feet to minimize risk as repairs continue. The city is working with state agencies to fast track a replacement dam. That may May not happen until 2034. And the city of San Diego wants your opinion on what to do with the badly damaged Ocean Beach Pier. The pier has been closed since January because of storm damage. The Ocean Beach Pier Task Force has decided to host a series of meetings to show the public options to repair or replace the pier. The first meeting is set for April 1st at the Liberty Station Conference Center. Well, the community came together this week after a six year old boy died in a car crash while on his way to school Wednesday morning. It happened near the intersection of Adams Avenue and Bayona Drive in Kensington. A candlelight vigil was held in his honor. Bouquets just continue to pile up near the crash area. At this point, investigators have not said what caused the collision, but police tell us that they are looking at how fast the cars were traveling and if distracted drivers played a role. It was a very freak accident, you know, and um, this could have happened to any of us. They're just doing their day to day going to school just like the rest of us. I just know that for me, I'm going to hold my kids a little bit tighter tonight. Oh, for sure. And police tell us that this will require a very technical investigation to find what the cars were doing at the time of the crash. We are told, though, that drugs and alcohol are not factors. Well, we now know when the murder trial of Larry Miliette will start. A trial date of October 9th was just set this week. Larry Miliette is accused of killing his wife, Maya Miliette. The Chula Vista mother of three has been missing since 2020. Her body has never been found, but a judge ruled back in January that there was enough evidence to hold her husband for trial. He has pleaded not guilty to one count of murder and one count of possession of an illegal assault weapon.
Well, we are now hearing from an attorney for two survivors of a violent kidnapping in Mexico. Eric Williams, Latavia Washington McGee, and two others traveled to Mexico on March 3rd. Williams is now back in North Carolina, where he lives with his wife. Both survivors are expecting long recoveries, and their attorneys are now working to make sure they are compensated. Trying to find some means of getting some money to help pay for the extensive amount of medical expenses that all parties have had to already pay and that they will have to pay in the future. Williams and McGee were kidnapped by cartels in Matamoros. They allegedly killed the other two who were traveling with them. And a man involved in the human smuggling operation that killed 13 people in Imperial County pleaded guilty in San Diego Federal Court. 49-year-old Jose Cruz Noguez, he admitted to coordinating a smuggling attempt back in 2021. The SUV carrying the victims crashed into a tractor trailer near Holtville. 13 Mexican and Guatemalan nationals died in that crash. Cruz Noguez will be sentenced back, excuse me, in this upcoming June. And San Diego continues to be a corridor for narcotics. Just halfway now through the fiscal year, and we are already on pace to surpass the record-breaking number of fentanyl busts in the entire year prior. Local San Diego Border Patrol agents are responsible for a 60-mile stretch of land and the entire California coastal border. Customs and Border Protection released their mid-year statistics on Monday. In the last six months, agents seized 765 pounds of meth, five 514 pounds of cocaine, 45 pounds of heroin, and 583 pounds of fentanyl. For comparison, 1,052 pounds of fentanyl was discovered total last fiscal year. And while they acknowledge that drugs are getting through, given the state of the opioid epidemic, there is a real sense of pride to keep drugs off of our streets. You say you don't even know how many lives, you know, some of these large fentanyl seizures where we have, you know, 230 pounds of fentanyl, which is like a million, million or so pills. That's, it's crazy. You think about all the people who that's not getting to, you know? So yes, yeah, so you feel that pride. Yeah, and just since October, about 86,000 people were apprehended after crossing illegally through San Diego. CBP tells me that's a 30% increase from this same time last year. A trend that has changed is who is coming across. It used to be primarily men from Mexico, but now the majority are family units from all around the world. For example, there's been a recent spike in asylum seekers from Turkey following the massive earthquake there. And this fiscal year, agents are also seeing a spike in those using the Pacific Ocean to cross the border. 619 apprehensions so far out at sea. And just recently, a Ponga boat flipped near Black Beach and eight migrants died all on the journey for a better life. Well, San Diegans packed a public meeting to weigh in on SDG&E's rate hike proposal. The California Public Utilities Commission held two public hearings Thursday to get public feedback. Many customers told us that they already can't afford their high bills and another rate hike will only make things worse. This is outrageous. This must stop. Last month, our bill was over $1,000. And prior to that, it was almost 900. Where does it end? Yeah, SDG&E says the rate hike is needed to help pay for costs to switch to renewable energy. It's part of an effort by SDG&E and other groups across the state and nation to reach net zero emissions by 2045. We want to make an infrastructure improvement to meet and exceed that in order to do the most environmentally responsible thing uh, for our community. SDG&E says that a decision on the proposed rate hikes won't come until later this year. If approved, the rate hike will go into effect next year. Well, now to the latest chapter of the ongoing 101 Ash Street real estate debacle. The broker at the center of the deal will return more than $9 million in taxpayer funds that he pocketed. This is part of a settlement approved by the city council in a 7-2 to two vote. This comes nine months after the city agreed to buy out the controversial leases for the Ash Street and Civic Center Plaza properties for more than $130 million after the city discovered that the Ash Street Street property was uninhabitable because of asbestos. The city council's president says that litigation would have cost the city upwards of $1 million with no guarantee the city would ever rec recoup that money. $9.4 million is a lot of money. 
There's a lot of good that can be done with it. Um, and I want it in our pockets uh, rather than on a, a craps table um, rolling the dice on Kevin Faulkner and his administration. San Diego County's district attorney also announced that she is filing criminal charges against the broker at the center of this settlement. He did plead guilty to a misdemeanor charge of violating conflict of interest law. A judge sentenced him to a year of probation and ordered him to pay a $400 fine. Well, we are hearing from El Cajon City leaders after two men who were just released from prison were arrested again. The men are accused of sexually assaulting a child at a motel. One of the offenders was staying at the motel through a voucher program through the PATH program. An emergency city council meeting was then held Tuesday to discuss hotel voucher concerns. The city is considering criminal background checks for voucher participants and a 90 day pause on accepting new vouchers. Hotels may be required to notify the city about the number of rooms used by vouchers and what agencies the vouchers have come from. We know that other agencies uh, such as the city of San Diego, the city of La Mesa, the city of Santee, the county of San Diego, the state of California, they're all using El Cajon disproportionately over other cities. The recommendations could begin getting approved as soon as Tuesday's city council meeting. Well, Governor Newsom visited Imperial Valley Monday, where excitement is growing over lithium. The Salton Sea has one of the largest lithium deposits in the world, and production of lithium batteries is expected to generate up to 12,000 new jobs. Energy officials estimate the Salton Sea can produce enough lithium to support 5 million electric vehicle batteries per year. We see this as one of the greatest economic opportunities of our lifetime. And we want California to dominate in this space. And we're doing that. Yeah, officials say 5 million EVs on the road could reduce yearly gas usage by 1.9 billion gallons. And before heading to the Salton Sea, CBS 8 was the only media invited to join the governor on his tour of a Scripps research vessel just this past weekend. CBS 8's Richard Allen was there and asked the governor about big issues facing San Diego. He started off by asking about the upcoming federal court decision out of Texas that could ban a widely used abortion pill on a nationwide level and how California then would respond. This is an assault on our health care. Calling this pending court ruling predetermined, Governor Newsom says he's hopeful the judge's decision would be immediately stayed as the case works its way up through the appeals process. It's meanwhile, we're going to do more and do better to make sure we're here for the people not only that we serve in the state of California, but feel an obligation to people across the country that are fearful about their lives uh, and their health and safety, and we're going to be there to protect them as well. Also pointing to California's move to codify the right to reproductive freedom in the state's constitution. It's California values. We respect the right to privacy, and that includes abortion and contraception. As for the rate hike proposed by SDG&E, which has infuriated so many San Diegans, I asked the governor what assurances San Diegans have that the California Public Utilities Commission, whose members he appoints, will have ratepayers' best interests at heart when making the final decision. And if they don't, then they don't belong on that board. We're seeing these ongoing increases, and we review them all case by case. And a very organized, thorough process, and uh, and we're not just going to roll over. As part of his state tour, Newsom is focused on tackling the homeless crisis. Anyone walk the streets and sidewalks. It's unacceptable what's happening. We hear you, we see you, we get it. One new statewide strategy is Care Court, which will provide court-ordered treatment of some Californians, many of them homeless, struggling with severe mental illness. San Diego has volunteered to pilot this program beginning this fall, although some critics have questioned whether it will trample on civil liberties. And we're now in the precipice of rebuilding new mindset of engagement, uh, respecting individual liberties, respecting process and oversight, court-ordered oversight and public uh, defenders. But at the same time, we're expecting more in terms of accountability on the other side, and that's what Care Court's about. Yeah, and Governor Newsom has also unveiled a new initiative to construct hundreds of new tiny homes across California to get more people off of the streets more immediately while they await permanent housing. San Diego County will be receiving at least initially 150 of these new tiny homes. And although the governor points out that that could easily expand to far more than that, considering how quickly these structures can be built and how inexpensive they are to manufacture. 
Well, Governor Newsom also says that he has struck a deal with lawmakers on his gas price penalty proposal. The plan is to create a watchdog group to monitor gas prices. The new proposal will hand the power over to the California Energy Commission to create a cap on how much oil companies are allowed to profit. The commissioners, which are appointed by the governor, will also have the ability to fine the companies when they go over that cap. The uh, appointees are going to be people who take a close look at the numbers, judge in a reasonable way how much oil refiners should make. Yeah, the bill is expected to be on the governor's desk next week. It would go into effect then 90 days after the governor signs it. Well, Juneteenth, a day to commemorate the end of slavery, is now a paid holiday for City of San Diego employees. The San Diego City Council made that decision after a recommendation from Mayor Todd Gloria. The action will go into effect this Juneteenth on June 19th. Up until this year, Juneteenth was only celebrated through presentation at San Diego City Hall. Very excited for her to be home here. Glad they're here. Ah, the USS Theodore Roosevelt is back home after spending 18 months at a shipyard in Washington state for renovations. The nuclear powered aircraft carrier arrived to Naval Base North Island Thursday afternoon with nearly 3000 sailors on board. The ship stretches two and a half football fields long and is nearly as tall as San Diego City Hall. It's now the third aircraft carrier based in San Diego. Well, debate for you. Should high schoolers here in California be required to offer free condoms? Newly proposed legislation would mandate that public high schools offer this contraception at no charge to their students. Supporters say this is critical to reduce rates of teen pregnancy and sexually transmitted diseases. These college students that we spoke to say that condoms were not offered in their high school here in San Diego, but do believe it would have been a good idea. The students are obviously going to engage in these types of activities anyways, so to practice safe sex is like a, a really good thing for schools to promote. If ultimately passed and signed into law, public high schools would have to begin providing free condoms to their students beginning this fall. In more health news, the CDC is warning about a potentially deadly fungus that's spreading at an alarming rate in hospitals. Cases of Candida auris have been reported in at least 30 states, including California. The CDC says that cases nearly doubled in 2021 and have continued to increase. Experts say the fungal infection is often drug resistant and can be deadly for people who have weak immune systems. Health officials recommend screenings to detect the fungus and taking special steps to isolate infected patients. We have to pull out kind of big gun antifungals um, to use for this. So fundamentally, we need to get on top of cleaning things, you know, um, using less antibiotics, good infection control practices. Yeah, the CDC says California has the second most cases in the nation. In September 2021, two patients tested positive in San Diego County at two separate health care facilities. Well, from fear of political discourse to even just making plans, there's a word for these modern day anxieties. CBS aides Abby Black takes a look at terms like anxiety and planxiety and spoke to a psychologist on how to manage all those feelings. Modern anxiety is known as anxiety, the fear of inflation or anxiety, the stress of being without our phone may sound silly, but these are very real feelings. Psychologists say by giving them a name, we can better manage our worries. A new anxiety management app that tracks in real time came up with some names of modern anxieties. The top three that you might be able to relate to, anxiety. what's going to happen to your bank or the cost of living, play anxieties when you don't want to make even the simplest of plans or anxieties when you're really worried about America's future. Um, I think we have all experienced some negative feelings that arise when these notifications come up on our phone. Dr. Vanji Acreage is a licensed educational psychologist in San Diego. She says anxiety is not a one size fits all. Most people experience anxiety, but they have different triggers. Well, if you are able to identify like it is this thing, like it is these particular notifications that are 
triggering my anxious feelings, then you can make a plan to let's turn off those notifications. Or There's other anxieties that you may be able to identify. How about anxiety? It's when you obsess about how your favorite team is doing. Climb anxiety is when you worry about climate change and the future of the planet. Then there's anxiety, and it comes from reading conspiracy theories and crazy posts. Tanxiety happens when you see too many pictures from war zones like Ukraine. Scamxiety is the very real fear that a lot of scammers are online waiting to trick you. Pinxiety is receiving overwhelmingly numbers of messages. But what about Titan anxiety? It's the worry over how tech titans are going to mess things up next. Choice anxiety is the paralyzing fear of making a decision online. And phone anxiety, weirdly, is the fear of losing your phone, even though it's responsible for a lot of these anxieties in the first place. These anxieties are very real. Acreage says some level and anxiety is healthy, but if we recognize the triggers, we can better overcome worries that ownership, that awareness, and then of course taking some real action. A few things that might have been left off the list. Gas anxiety when we're anxious about the rising gas prices or COVID anxiety, the fear of COVID or traffic anxiety, the stress of knowing that we have to sit in traffic. The point here is, is that when we recognize these feelings, psychologists say we can better manage the anxiety. Thanks for shedding some light, truly, Abby, thanks. Well, a group of Rady Children's Hospital patients are back after an exciting weekend with the Padres. 12 teens undergoing cancer treatment spent the weekend at, as official members of the team. They were signed to the organization and sent their spring training facility in Arizona. The VIP trip gave them on-field access and the chance to interact with their favorite players. Baseball's a pin apart been a part of my life for so long and to finally meet like some major league players it's like a dream come true yeah wishing everybody good health the trip was made possible by the generosity of mike and lisa peckham well, more teens have been admitted to San Diego County's emergency shelter for children over the last two and a half years than in recent than in the recent past. This comes at a time when reports of physical abuse and neglect are up as well. Teens entering the system face different challenges than younger children, and there is a great need for their support in San Diego. Here's our Carlo Chiquetto. This is our all of our kids that have been with us over the years and our adopted children here in the middle. We have all of their adopted adoption day photos. Kaniya Webster is a resource parent. He used to be known as a foster parent. Now we're resource parents. More than 20 years ago, she and her husband first opened their home to a couple of neighborhood teens whose mother was having a rough time. How many children have you have you found? Uh, we're in the 20s. Yeah, I think of 20 or 21, maybe. All trying to heal. But all of them um, that we've worked with have always just really wanted somebody to, to be there for them. We absolutely have a need for more resource families. Kimberly Giardina is Director of Child Welfare Services for the San Diego County Health and Human Services Agency. Our goal is always to get kids back home with their families if it's safe to do so. That doesn't always work, and it's a greater challenge to find a home for a teen. If grandma's caring for that teenager and, and things really start to escalate and get difficult, it can be really hard to, to figure out how to support and sustain that placement. Same thing with a foster home. So we've definitely seen more teens uh, going to Polinsky on a on a, what we call a change of placement, where we're needing to find a different level of care for that use. The Polinsky Center has been San Diego County's emergency shelter for kids for almost 30 years now. Children end up here for various reasons, from neglect to abuse. And over the last year or so, they've seen an increase in the number of teens. Numbers obtained by CBS 8 through a public records request show an increase in physical abuse and neglect in children of all ages admitted to the Polinsky Center over the past year. But Giardina says overall, Cases of abuse reported to the county were down. But there were definitely changes in sort of the types of abuse and, and the needs that we saw for families. Giardina points to pandemic impacts on society and a mental health care system that can't keep up. We've had uh, more youth with overdoses. We've had more youth with really significant mental health needs more use uh, with runaway behavior, and that can make it harder for them to sort of stay in a family-like setting placement. 
bouncing from placement to placement makes it tough for teens to trust. And as they age out of the system, they still need support. When you're a youth in foster care, oftentimes there are labels of being the bad kid, you did something wrong to get into the system. And so there's a lot of personal blame put on a young person. Simone Hids Monroe knows she went into the system with her three siblings when their mother died. They were told it was highly unlikely that they would stay together. It was heartbreaking and unfortunate that no one stood up for us as a, as a resource parent. They were able to stay together at San Pasquale Academy, San Diego's residential school for foster youth. Now, Simone is making a difference. So Just In Time for Foster Youth is a supportive, caring community for foster youth, current and former foster youth ages 18 to 26. From food to furniture, young people in need can find necessities, but they can also find connections and a community. Kanaya will tell you it's not easy to be a resource parent, but it's not easy for the kids either. Somebody who's watching this who thinks they could but are fearful, what would you say to them? Come in and take some classes. Um, you're more than welcome to come in and, and kind of see what this is all about. Teenagers are supposed to make mistakes while they're at home. That's when you want them to do that. They're supposed to learn from those mistakes. And so they need parents to help them through that. And if they don't get that, then they're making mistakes and making mistakes and making mistakes. And then that brings them into adulthood, still making those mistakes. With no one to teach them any better. Has this been rewarding for you? Uh, more so than I could ever tell you <laughs> it is. Carlo Cicchetto, CBS 8 News. Yeah, and the need is real. If you'd like to learn more about becoming a resource parent, head to sdcaresforkids.com. And also, Jeff Zevely did a really beautiful profile for, um, for Just In Time Foster Youth earlier this week. You can see that on cbs8.com. Just click on the Zevely Zone. Well, history is being made in the South Bay. The USA blind men's team had their first game and won against Canada. The team has eight athletes who have visual impairments, along with two sided goalkeepers and two alternates. Blind soccer has been part of the Paralympic game since 2004, but the U.S. has never had a team. Come 2028, this will change when L.A. hosts the Olympic and Paralympic Games. The U.S. will get an automatic entry into the blind soccer competition as the host country. And just like um, the U.S., Canada is trying to build their first team, so it's great that, you know, they're here and we're hosting them um, for this historic match. Yeah, and admission to the game is free to the public. Well, Caltrans held its annual awards ceremony this week for its Adopt a Highway program. CBS 8's Brian White caught up with one group in Lemon Grove who's really making a difference in their community. Be the change you want to see. That's the motivation for this group in Lemon Grove who are setting the bar really high for the rest of the county. One piece of litter at a time. Oh, it feels awesome. It feels really good. Uh, to be a part of something, to be the change that we want to see, there's no better feeling. Here on this stretch of State Route 94 through Lemon Grove, you may have seen this group of passionate volunteers picking up roadside trash. There's nobody coming to save us, we have to save ourselves. And we do that by coming together as a community. We do that as coming together as groups to make an impact, to make a difference. Chris Williams is a member of the Lemon Grove Improvement Council. And they've been taking matters into their own hands. We got to roll up our sleeves, get a little bit dirty, create some action. Last year, they picked up 237 bags of trash from on and off ramps, the most of any group in this Caltrans district. And this week, they were awarded for it. Lemon Grove Improvement Council. first thing you see when you get on the freeway is your entrance ramp. So having that be clean and, and neat and then manicured really improves the driving experience and improves community pride. Each group in the Adopt a Highway program is eligible for a $250 a month stipend as part of the Clean California Initiative. Chris and the others in Lemon Grove have been saving theirs to help the city reopen the recreation center. The rec center has been closed for about 12 years to the, to the general public. It can be rent out for private events and parties, but not for really what rec centers is best for, which is providing a safe space, 
place for these kids, providing youth sports, mentorship. They've saved $3,500 so far, and other fundraising efforts have brought in another 4000 Between this and applying for grants and looking for business sponsorships, they're determined to find a way to get these doors open. You can't spell community without unity. You need people to come together like what we're doing here to make sure that communities like Lemon Grove get what they're getting, you know, north of the eight. In Lemon Grove, Brian White, CBSA. For more than two decades, researchers have been attempting to increase the population of the endangered Mexican gray wolf. Thanks to help from the California Wolf Center in Julian, that goal has become a reality with the population soaring more than 23% since the species survival plan began. Here's our CBS State's Evan Narani with this Earth 8 report. It's being applauded as a recovery success story. The nearly extinct Mexican gray wolf population rebounding after a 25 year effort to save them. Across the world, species are dying every day. But for us in the United States who work in species recovery and in Mexico to come together and save a species, the Mexican gray wolf, has been amazing. The dramatic shift is thanks in part to the California Wolf Center in Julian. Acres of land where two dozen Mexican gray wolves roam and even a few northwestern gray wolves enjoy the open space and sometimes even the wild weather. I will say the wolves had an awesome time. They loved the snow. They are designed for snow. They have a double coat. They loved it. It was the humans that had more issues. The humans, however, still play a vital role in growing the population. In facilities like this, adult Mexican gray wolves can be brought together to mate, with their pups being reintroduced into the wild. Researchers will lure a mother wolf away from her den and integrate the pups bred in captivity with those born in the wild. When mom comes back, she accepts the new wolves in the pack in a process they call cross-fostering. Red Riding Hood story of the big bad wolf doesn't, isn't really true. They're very family focused. And so when that mother comes back to her den, it's just a couple more puppies. So she doesn't count them and they're just all welcome. Welcome by the whole pack. The California Wolf Center has been a part of the Mexican gray wolf species survival plan since 1997. The goal there is to be able to increase genetic diversity in these wolves and ideally to be able to reintroduce them into the wild. Seeing uh, the number passing not just 200, but also seeing that compared to the 2021 numbers, that was a 23% increase and seeing such a significant recovery for them, especially starting from just 13 individuals is so, so exciting and so impressive that our efforts have made a difference. It also marks the seventh consecutive year of population growth, more than doubling their total numbers across Arizona and New Mexico since 2017. So for their enrichment, they're receiving peanut butter and honey dog treats. So we can go ahead and just do one, two, three. Okay. See, they'll come and investigate. <laughs> Oh, they saw that coming. Yes. They also have incredible hearing, and so they can really hear when we start moving around. In the wild, wolves act as an apex predator, helping with population control of elk, deer, and bison, though many ranchers across the Southwest view them as a threat to their livestock. It's a fine dance, but it's a collaboration, and it really is important for everybody involved that we want the wolves to feel successful that we can reintroduce and we want the rancher to be successful it's their livelihood the california wolf center provides resources to those ranchers and while this endangered species is now looking toward a sustainable future their work isn't over your mission is not done just because those animals are at a sustainable population we need to continue to make sure that future generations understand that this animal is so important Evan, thank you. And despite the wolves being owned by the federal government, the California Wolf Center in Julian provides all care for the wolves that they have on site, from food to veterinarian care. They rely on donations from the public and are open for tours by reservation. They also have an Amazon wish list for items that can help their efforts in protecting these animals. You can find more on CBS8.com. 
Well, if you haven't touched your garden all winter, you might be thinking about doing some spring cleaning when the rain finally does move out. But before you start trimming away, don't forget there may be some new little residents in your trees and shrubs. Meteorologist Sean Stiles shows us how to be bird aware in another Earth 8 report. Spring has sprung even though it's still winter here in California and with all the rain gardens are exploding but so is mother nature and homeowner here in Solana Beach Deb Berg says make sure you look in your garden before you do any tree trimming you might be cutting out someone else's home. The hummingbirds actually love this plant. Deb Berg is a citizen naturalist and has set up her garden as a sanctuary for nature. The word I'm trying to get out is that right now it is nesting season. And one should think twice before trimming trees, bushes and palms. Having already had a hummingbird nest in her yard this year and plenty in the past, she's on a mission to help our feathered friends. February is the month that I personally see hummingbirds in my garden. Um, I watch them from egg to fledgling and if they make it past the crows and nature, I want to give them a fighting chance. Generally speaking, when it comes to pruning trees and hedges, they fare best when they're dormant in the winter. By trimming in the spring, you put them at risk of disease and pests. Also, think twice about palms. Palm fronds that are dead are actually a great nesting spot for Orioles. And so even those, well, people might say, I need to get rid of those right now. I wouldn't. All of nature's wonders have found a home and a place to raise their young in her garden. From monarch butterflies, multiple hummingbird nests, to doves out her back door. She says with all the pressure put on nature by the modern world, if you're going to do some trimming in your yard, take a moment to look around. Go out there for, for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Enjoy nature and, and look and observe and then look to see, do you see a bird circling around? I mean, just, it's so easy to just look before you cut. It's that easy. So what she's hoping for is you look around your home in your trees and bushes for our friends of flight that may have set up home. Exactly. Look for someone else's home. Look for the bird's home. <laughs> so all it takes is just a quick look around the garden to make sure there's no nest and really now is not the time to trim anyway, so if you can wait a couple months, you'll be helping Mother Nature. We'll send it back to you in the studio. We'll take it, Sean, thanks. Well, for a San Marcos man, it was the moment of truth. He built a Viking ship, but would it float? In this Zevely zone, Jeff heads to Mission Bay and grabs an oar. Tom Kopmeyer was expecting a handful of people at a ship launch. Instead, the boat launch is lined with spectators. Look at this. Unusual happening. As San Diegans caught their first glimpse of Sleipner. It's beautiful. It's pretty gorgeous. I'm stunned by how beautiful it is. Tom Kottmeyer, the 77-year-old man who built a Viking ship was... Excited! <laughs> After spending three years handcrafting this beauty, I'm the king of the world! Hey! This was Tom's day to launch it. Heave ho! As the mast was raised, so too was my concern. This is um, my first Viking ship waiver. <laughs> when asked to sign a legally binding document. Raiding or pillaging of any sort in violation of applicable maritime. <laughs> however, anything, I'm not signing that. However, anything you may accidentally raid or pillage of value belongs to the owner and operators. Oh, okay. <laughs> if we do pillage, I'm told to look for silver. You want silver is one of the most important things, and that often comes in oh. silver crosses, silver chalices. Last summer, we watched Tom work on Sleipner five days a week to honor his Swedish heritage. See how the mainsail says, I want to go sail. The sailboat is 33 feet long, but would it float? I'm launching the ship. Not only is Sleipner seaworthy, Nine San Diego sailors steered straight into the wind. This is a historic moment. Just like the Vikings did in 800 AD. Bro. Bro. We put our backs into it on our maiden voyage. Bro. Bro. 
Here's hoping the wind is at his back when Captain Tom takes Sleipner to Sweden next year to sail the same waters his ancestors did. Is this real? I mean, I'm really standing on my ship. Your dream came true. It did. You, you know what the song says? There's a dock right next to the ramp. And that's you the haven't road. got a dream. How can you have a dream? Come to the banner. In the Zevoli Zone, <laughs> Jeff Zevoli, CBS 8. I myself am also Scandinavian, so pretty cool. Tom's ship was named after a magical eight-legged winged horse. Well, as always, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for staying informed. Be sure to join me each week as I take you around San Diego. Once again, Aztecs, we are rooting for you. I'm Jenny Day for CBS 8. Take good care of yourself.